Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Research America Alliance discussion. I am Ellie Dahoney, Research America's Vice President of Policy and Advocacy, and I am so appreciative to everyone in the audience for being with us today. And thank you and your organizations for your partnership in our alliance. If your organization is not in our alliance, we're glad to have you here as a guest and um, would love it if you'd like to explore becoming a member with us. Um, you know, from NIH to ARPA-H to um, assuring a policy and regulatory environment in which both public and private sector innovation can, medical innovation can thrive, um, to working to strengthen the public health capacity in our nation and more. Um, our alliance works, every member works really hard. We work hard together to advance the public good and would love it if you join us. Um, my colleague Ann Mandeville's email, I think, is in the chat, and you can always call or email me. My cell is actually in my um, address block, as scary as that is from a spam perspective. <laughs> so uh, call, email us, and we'll talk. Um, our special guest today is Lauren Block. Um, Lauren is a wonderful colleague. She is the Director of Health Policy and Regulatory Affairs at Agra Drinker. And Lauren um, is going to provide an update on all things ARPA-H. So what's going on in Congress, um, administrative actions, administration actions that are administrative in nature, um, that are you know, together the, trying to advance the, the mission and objectives of this new health innovation incubator. And Lauren, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I, um, let me just say also that I think you all know this, but Go ahead and type your questions, if you would, into the Q&A box or chat, and we'll get to as many of them as we can during the Q&A portion of today's session. Um, Lauren, over to you. Thanks, Ellie. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. It's really a privilege to get to talk to you about what, what has been one of my favorite policy topics of the year. Uh, a lot of interesting things rolled into this whole ARPA-H journey that the administration and Congress have been on for just over the past year, and I'm excited to get to speak to you about it. So we'll start with what is ARPA-H? Um, you've likely seen some buzz about it in the news over the past several months, but if you haven't, it is a proposed new agency dedicated to health research that would be modeled on DARPA, um, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which you've likely heard of because DARPA is famous for having invented the internet, for having invented GPS. It's a part of the Department of Defense and they are a rather small office that's designed to be really nimble, really innovative, and to drive forward the development of technologies that support the warfighter. That same Advanced Research Projects Agency, or ARPA approach, has also been applied to the fields of energy and to the intelligence community with the creation of ARPA-E and IARPA within the past decade. So the thought is that the, that same model could be really instrumental in moving the health research field forward, hence the proposal to create ARPA-H. It would be intended to focus on milestone-driven, high-risk, high-reward projects. So rather than just having money go out and allowing the scientific community to um, do the great work that they do in basic research to see what's out there and learn more from that. This would be very targeted to go out and research a specific topic against specific milestones. And if it doesn't work, well, knowing it doesn't work is almost as beneficial as knowing something that does work as long as you could figure that out quickly. So take on something that's really high risk, fail fast if need be, but hopefully succeed and get those for that really high reward. It's intended to support research that industry and traditional government research programs cannot. So when you think about federal research or academic research programs, that's more of that, um, that basic research that I just referenced where grants go out uh, in response to proposals from researchers and they have an opportunity to use those funds to explore different topics and kind of see, see what they learn along the way. Uh, and basic research is such a core part of the overall healthcare and health research system and is really important in terms of driving our knowledge forward. But it is not designed to be able to support this kind of high risk research that ARPA-H could support. Similarly, industry, because of their business interests, are not going to take on a project that's likely to fail because it just, it just doesn't make good business sense. So this is where ARPA-H could fill a gap in the current re health research field. It would be complementary to existing agencies like NIH, but would have a very distinct culture. So this is not meant uh, to replace anything that's already being done. 
in government. Rather, it's a new approach that would dovetail nicely with what is already within the federal research ecosystem. Now, ARPA was actually just stood up earlier this spring, and I will talk a little bit more about how we came to that point uh, in just a minute. But first, I want to go into a little bit more detail about what this new agency is intended to focus on. It's intended to speed breakthroughs in biomedical science and medicine. Again, this is not just to move research along incrementally, but to really uh, come up with big ideas and hopefully help us leap forward rather than stepping forward more gradually. In terms of where it might focus in the health field, it could be everything from prevention to treatments and cures um, and across all sorts of health conditions. I think sometimes when a new health program crops up in the government, there's a tendency to think, oh, th this is a new bucket of money that can be used to fund my uh, disease or condition research on that topic. Although I'm sure ARPA-H will eventually support research that benefits treatments and cures for specific diseases and conditions, it is not intended to be structured in the way that current NIH and CDC programs are, where you have dedicated line items to support funding for research on specific diseases. Rather, ARPA-H's research is envisioned to be more broad to support building capabilities, technologies, and platforms that could span multiple diseases. Um, some examples of what that might be are things like gene editing or advancing imaging technology, things like that, that you could see uh, delivering benefits for multiple conditions. And it's also intended to support the translation of research into solutions for patients. So when I said just a minute ago that ARPA-H would be really complementary to some of the work that's already being done at NIH and some of our other basic research institutions around the country, this is what I mean, to take that knowledge that's gained through the basic research process and figure out how to convert it into things that can be used by patients to uh, help treat diseases and to improve their health overall. So how did we get here with this new agency? Uh, it's, it's been a really interesting journey involving uh, outside stakeholders, Congress, appropriators and authorizers in Congress and the administration. And, I've included some of the highlights on this timeline here. So although we first started to uh, hear a lot about ARPA-H just about a year ago, there has been a push to create this new agency for several years now. Um, there's always been a thought that there are things that in neither industry nor federal research programs can do, and so there's an opportunity for an entity like ARPA-H to come in and fill that gap. The Suzanne Wright Foundation, which is an organization that's dedicated to the fight against pancreatic pancreatic cancer it has been one of the most vocal supporters of the creation of ARPA-H. Um, they and others referred to it as HARPA for many years. So if you've heard that term, this is, this is the same concept that's been batted around for, for years now. But the process to actually create ARPA-H really kicked off just over a year ago when President Biden issued his fiscal year 2022 budget proposal to and included a uh, proposal to fund ARPA-H. Um, Biden has been very committed to medical research. He saw that the cancer moonshot could have a real impact on the way that we do research a little bit differently. And so he's been keenly interested in moving ARPA-H forward uh, since he proposed that last year. Then last fall, Congress got in on the game, beginning with Representative Anna Eshoo from California, introducing what she called the ARPA-H Act that would authorize the creation of ARPA-H. About a month later, her colleagues Fred Upton and Diana DeGette introduced the 21st Century Cures 2.0 bill, which among other provisions included language that would also authorize ARPA-H, but did have some differences from Eshoo's bill. Things really heated up this spring when the Senate also introduced a bill that would authorize ARPA-H. So Patty, Senators Patty Murray and Senator Richard Burr introduced their own version of the ARPA-H Act. And shortly thereafter, just a few days later, Congress actually provided funding to create ARPA-H in their appropriations bill for fiscal year 2022. So if you're keeping track, we now have both authorizers coming in with three different authorizing bills and appropriators saying, we're going to create this by actually giving funding for it. So not exactly the way uh, you learn how laws are made and programs are funded in the schoolhouse rock version, but uh, this, is, this is the path we've followed for ARPA-H. 
Just a few days after that, uh, because the FY22 omnibus was passed rather late this year, Biden actually issued his fiscal year 23 budget proposal to include more money for ARPA-H in fiscal year 23. So lots of action all across the board in March. Then in May, now that Congress had appropriated funds for ARPA-H, HHS Secretary uh, Becerra formally established ARPA-H within the National Institutes of Health. Um, and I'll pause and make note that that location was significant um, and has been up for debate and I'll get into that more in just a minute. That same month, the House passed ARPA, the ARPA-H Act. So this was Representative Eshoo's bill. Uh, it had been revised at that time. Um, Representative Diana Get and Representative Fred Upton had agreed to co-sponsor the bill. So it had bipartisan support um, and it moved forward out of the Energy and Commerce Committee in May. And then la just last week in June, the full House voted to pass the ARPA-H Act. So that bill made it all the way through the House. And just days later, again, we've got our layering of authorizing actions and appropriating action. The House proposed $2.75 billion for ARPA-H in their fiscal year 23 budget proposal. So the end of that timeline brings us to a point where ARPA-H has been created within NIH uh, and has been funded at $1 billion for fiscal year 2022. And we have one authorizing bill that has passed the House and another that has been introduced in the Senate. So when you have all of these cooks in the kitchen, the authorizers, appropriators, and the administration, um, they don't always agree, but there are a few points on which everyone seems to agree. First is that the director of ARPA-H should be appointed by the, the president and should not be confirmed by the Senate. Um, regardless of where ARPA-H is located, it's recognized that this needs to be an independent organization, um, needs to be a high profile organization and having a presidential appointment of the director versus uh, secretarial appointment helps with that. Um, the Senate confirmation point was one that was debated. At one point, the House bill would have required Senate confirmation, but ultimately that provision was pulled in part because the Senate confirmation process can be very slow. And right now the health committee, which would be responsible for handling that uh, confirmation process already has a couple of other candidates that they need to vet. Everyone agrees that ARPA-H should have broad hiring and compensation authority. So this would allow the agency to bring people on without having to follow traditional civil service laws uh, and pay scale limits. Um, this, is, this follows the model set by DARPA and is thought to be very important in recruiting the high level of talent that, are need, that is needed for an ARPA. Um, the types of people who you would expect to come work at an ARPA are those who probably could do very well in the private sector as well. Um, so having these hiring and compensation authorities gives the government a little bit more leverage to bring in these highly qualified individuals to entice them to work for an ARPA-H for a few years. Which brings me to my next point. Unlike other federal agencies, the intent of ARPA-H and any other ARPA is not that someone comes to this agency and works there for their entire career. Instead, you would have a director who might only be there for four or five years, and then program managers. These are the people who are actually making the decisions about where the funding goes and then are overseeing the projects. They would only be there for about three years, uh, and all of them would have the option for one extension. This is something that was spearheaded uh, at DARPA and has been found to really create a sense of urgency for everyone working at the agency. Um, the people at DARPA, they're ID badges actually say their last day on it. So you can walk around the halls and you can see, oh, this person has just a year left. This person has six months left here. And that helps to spur their highly innovative, fast paced culture because everyone knows they're on a tight timeline to get something done. RPH will also have a lot of flexibility in how it spends money. They would be able to issue traditional contracts and grants or cooperative agreements, which you see at a lot of the other federal research agency. But you would also, they, would, they will also be able to do prize competitions and other transactions. Uh, and other transactions are exactly what the term sounds like. They are things 
other than contracts, grants, cooperative agreements, or prizes. So it's another way for a federal agency to get money to a private sector partner in order to um, best deliver on whatever objectives are being set for that particular project. Um, and that the authority to issue other transactions is something that has to be granted by Congress. A few other agencies like DARPA uh, and NASA and some parts of NIH have that authority, but it's not broadly used throughout government because it is intended to be restricted for the agencies that need to do some of the most creative, innovative research. ARPA-H will also not be subject to advisory council requirements for awards, as you see at NIH, where an advisory council has to weigh in on how uh, an institute or center is spending their money. So everyone agrees on that point and the others on this slide. Um, and that has been, I think, really helpful in getting us as far as we've gotten in terms of creating this agency and in moving the authorizing language forward. That there's a recognition, not only that this would be a good thing for the federal research landscape, um, that it has bipartisan support, but also that there's a, a general understanding of how it should operate. And a lot of that is drawn from the lessons learned of DARPA. Now, of course, with that many people involved, there's, there's no way they can agree on everything. And these are the key points where there are, there's still disagreement on how ARPA-8 should be created and run. Um, the first one, there's been a lot of coverage in the news about this is where should it be located in terms of where should the organization be within the federal government? Um, the ARPA-H is currently located within NIH. That is where HHS Secretary DeSera established it in his authority that was given through the FY22 omnibus. Um, it is not an institute or center. NIH leadership have been very clear to point that out. It's not intended to function in that way. It is a totally different entity that is within NIH, which gives it the ability to leverage NIH's uh, administrative supports, but it is still intended to have a distinct culture and to operate differently from a traditional institute or center. Meanwhile, uh, Representative Escher's bill that just passed the House would establish ARPA-H as a separate operating division within HHS. So this would put it on par with NIH or CDC or FDA or the other operating divisions. And those in favor of this are, argue that in order for ARPA-H to most effectively collaborate with other agencies, it needs to be at that higher level. It shouldn't be a part of NIH, but it should be an equal to NIH. The Senate bill agrees with the administration's position on this and would place ARPA-H within NIH. And I think at this point, um, where ARPA-H ultimately ends up as the authorizing language moves forward is really anyone's guess. Um, it's, it's an interesting policy debate and I encourage you to, to follow it as it unfolds over the next several months. With the question of where ARPA-H should be located, there's also a question of to whom the director should report. So the traditional Options would be either reporting to the HHS secretary, as is proposed in the House bill, or reporting to the NIH director, as is proposed in the Senate bill. But the administration, um, based on what was directed in the omnibus appropriations bill, actually ended up with a third hybrid option. So although ARPA-H is located within NIH right now, the director does not report to the NIH director. Instead, he or she will report to the um, will report to the HHS secretary. That's an interesting twist on the way and a further evidence of the fact that ARPA-H is not just another institute or center. There's also a debate about how ARPA-H should be structured organizationally. Uh, earlier this spring, NIH announced that they are creating 14 different program offices within NIH. And so these offices range from more administrative functions to more subject matter functions um, and will just uh, serve as the operating structure for that agency. Um, some House legislators were concerned that this was too many offices for what's supposed to be a relatively small, nimble organization. And so the bill that passed the House would limit those offices to six, with two thirds of them being dedicated to research and development. In terms of award authorities, um, although there is a general agreement that ARPA-H needs to have a lot of flexibility in how it spends its money, the House bill would place some limits on any awards going to entities outside of the United States. 
and the Senate bill would place some um, red tape on the use of other transactions, which, as I mentioned, is not an authority that's very common in the federal government. While there's recognition that ARPA-H needs to be able to coordinate uh, and collaborate with other federal agencies, exactly how that gets done is still a little bit up for debate. Both the House and Senate bills would create some sort of interagency council with representatives from different federal agencies that meet regularly with ARPA-H and help inform research priorities. Um, the House bill also includes a little bit more detail on how ARPA-H would uh, work with FDA and CMS, um, specifically requiring ARPA-H to reimburse FDA for the cost of reviews of any ARPA-H developed products that ultimately go to the FDA for approval. And the Senate bill also includes some detail on that, um, but makes no reference to direct collaboration with CMS. So uh, we'll see how that unfolds as well as the legislation moves forward. And then in terms of funding, things have been, this has been all over the map. The initial proposal by the Biden administration last spring was 6.5 billion. ARPA-H ultimately ended up with 1 billion this year that they can use through the end of 2024. The, House bill that was just passed would authorize 2.5 billion over five years or 500, uh, 500 million a year. And then the Senate bill doesn't specify an amount at this point. Um, a, a key question with funding is you wanna strike a balance of giving ARPA-H enough money that it can be really effective in its mission, but not so much money that it's struggling to get the money out the door in a, in a meaningful, uh, logical way within the, the time that the funds are available to it. And then lastly, this is another one that's been in the news a lot recently. It's been uh, fun to watch. Um, there's a debate on where ARPA-H should physically be located. Um, one hallmark of DARPA is that it is located outside of the Pentagon. Now it's located just a few miles down the road in, in Roslyn, Virginia, but it is not in that um, epicenter of DOD activities, and that's thought to be important in DARPA retaining its own culture. So there's a thought that ARPA-H should similarly not be located on the NIH campus in order to develop its own culture. Right now, it is on the NIH campus just because it is just getting started and that's where there's space, although I think the administration has acknowledged that it, it may not end there, end up there long term. Uh, meanwhile, both the House and Senate bills would restrict ARPA-H from being on the NIH campus at all or in the DC area. So uh, right now that has led to different members of Congress jockeying for ARPA-H to be in their state. I've heard Massachusetts, Texas, California, Georgia, and Ohio all suggested as possible locations for ARPA-H. Um, possible your member of Congress has spoken about this because they all seem to want a piece of the ARPA-H action. Uh, so we'll see where that ends up. Um, be, will be interesting to watch. So where is ARPA-H right now? Um, with all of this legislation going on and debate with the administration, it's sometimes hard to remember that this is actually a new agency that has been created and they are doing work to get up and running. Uh, in May, Secretary Becerra and the president announced the appointment of the acting deputy director. His name is Dr. Adam Russell and he's an anthropologist by training who has over 10 years working at DARPA and IARPA, that's the, the ARPA within the intelligence community. So he understands how an ARPA should work um, and is really committed to getting ARPA-H off on the right foot. Now he is just the acting deputy director. It is not thought that he is in the running for the uh, inaugural director position. That search is ongoing and I expect that it will be announced relatively soon because it is a real priority of the administration to get ARPA-H up and running. As I mentioned, they've established 14 program offices. And so NIH is in the process of hiring people to start running those offices. Although most of the program managers, again, the people who are actually responsible for setting the research priorities for ARPA-H and, and spending the money and selecting the partners, those people are not likely to be hired until the inaugural director is in place um, because he or she will really drive a lot of the focus areas for the agency and, um, we want to have that person in place and weighing in on the decisions for hiring for program managers. So what happens next? Um, while I would love to have an ARPA-H crystal ball, um, I do not, but these are my 
best guesses. Um, it's possible that the Senate will mark up their authorizing bill this summer, although they are running out of legislative days this summer. And with it being a PDUFA year, um, we know that they are actively working on pre-conference negotiations for that and are hoping to wrap those up in July. So that pushes other health-related priorities like ARPA-H a little bit to the side. So uh, it's, it's unclear whether they will actually get around to that markup. It's possible they will end up taking up the House bill, but regardless, I think we will see conference or pre-conference negotiations between the two chambers this year because it is a real priority for them to move it forward. Um, and because funds have already been appropriated for this, it uh, puts additional pressure on the authorizers to actually move their legislation forward and give some more structure and more permanent authorities to RPH. Especially now that the House proposal is already out with uh, proposed funding, I think it's very likely that ARPA-H will get additional funding in the fiscal year 23 appropriations. Um, those are likely to be finalized after the election, hopefully before the end of the calendar year. So there'll still be a while before we see the actual amount that's included. Then we should see a director appointed by the president. Um, of course, the NIH director spot is also still open. And again, I don't have a crystal ball here, but I think it's likely that we'll see an announcement for the NIH director appointee before the ARPA-H director appointee is announced, um, in part because the, the, the pool of candidates for the ARPA-H director may be different uh, depending on who comes in as NIH director because they will be working so closely together. Uh, and I'll, I'll also note on a, a somewhat related subject that the White House announced just last week the appointment of Arati Prabhakar as the um, nominee for the director of the Office of, of Science and Technology Policy, or OSTP. That's a cabinet level position, so she will have to be confirmed by the Senate. But what's interesting is she was actually the first female director of DARPA. So she has an ARPA background uh, and really appreciates that model. And I think it will be good for ARPA age to have that kind of uh, representation of somebody who understands the type of work they need to do in the White House and on the cabinet. And then lastly, I think as the legislation moves forward and as ARPA age starts to figure out exactly where uh, as, they, as they start to hire up and need to find places for their staff to work, we will see exactly where this agency ends up being located, whether it's in the DC area, on the NIH campus, or somewhere completely different. So still a lot to be decided, but this is a really exciting step for the health and science research communities. Um, I think there's very broad support for ARPA-H and people are excited about the type of work that um, it can do. So I encourage you to continue following this topic and see how things unfold over the next several months. And with that, I will pause and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, everyone. Lauren, thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, it was really great to get that overview and you did it so beautifully and so quickly. Um, <laughs> So thank you. You know, I thought I might knock out um, some of the answers to some great questions we have in the chat um, real quickly, because I think some of them are going to take a bit more time. Um, so as Ed um, Long noted in the chat, um, ARPA-H under the House subcommittee mark of the Labor H bill. So that is in um, the Labor H subcommittee is where ARPA-H funding is currently housed. Um, right. along with NIH, CDC, and ARC, for example. Um, the House uh, subcommittee bill that's being uh, marked up by the full committee on Thursday includes a $1.75 billion increase for ARC over what's in FY22. So all overall, a $2.75 billion increase. Um, and a couple other questions. The NCI director, I, I'm pretty sure, reports to the NIH director, not to the secretary of HHS, although it is confusing because of the, the nomination process for the um, NCI um, director. Um, and let me see. Um, I think, the, oh, the other thing I think was a really cool question, and that was, can health services research for um, priorities such as oral health um, is that something that ARPA-H could um, consider? And the fact is that uh, the legislation that has been proposed in the House and the Senate not only doesn't preclude health innovation as well as medical innovation, but states 
um, at least the House bill states that health innovation is in the mix. So there's nothing that would prevent ARPA-H from, from considering that kind of a project. And I think an important um, way of thinking about ARPA-H that Senator Burr has been really great about articulating is that it's not only going to be an incubator or is envisioned as an incubator that takes on projects, but brokers projects. So something really cool in the health services space may came out, come in and ARPA-H would say, wait, that belongs at ARC or, you know, um, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. This belongs at BARDA. And so they would talk to BARDA. So it's also going to have that role so that it doesn't lose these great ideas that fit better into maybe a basic research construct at NIH or BARDA or ARPA-H. And so let me stop there and pose some of these questions, too, to Lauren. Um, one that I think is really important is, could you provide a couple of examples of the type of product, uh, projects that might be envisioned under this ARPA-H model, as opposed to those that might be an NIH funded or another funded type of project? Sure, uh, and I'm not an ARPA-H program manager, so we'll, right. it still remains right. to be seen what the focus is, but I think, think really broad capabilities. I mean, think something like the internet. That That's not specific to a particular type of war fighting, if you're thinking about it being invented by DARPA. Um, it's something that can have broad-based applications. So as I mentioned earlier, something like, in, you know, like what's the next gen MRI? Uh, advancing imaging technologies has been something that's been thrown around as a possible idea. Or gene editing, um, nanotechnology, other things that could um, really apply across multiple diseases. Um, improved diagnostics is another one that I've seen uh, mentioned as a possible topic. So uh, not to say that ARPA-H will never take on a disease specific project, but I think the idea is that because it is filling a gap in the current research ecosystem, um, which, which includes uh, fund, funding for some of these disease specific topics, that it would be intended to focus on breakthroughs that could really apply across multiple multiple areas of health. I really like that. So if you think about, it wouldn't just, maybe it wouldn't be uh, regenerative medicine because that's already happening in the private sector and in through NIH funding into the private sector for development space, but maybe it would be, how do you reduce the cost dramatically through a global infrastructure? Um, how do you do an internet of, um, human genotive, genomics, where there's a different language that through which you could, genes could talk to each other and reveal um, early diagnosis of cancers, of all cancers. You know, it's big thinking and they may be big dollar projects, but um, so I really love that, the internet example there, um, Lauren. So um, I think a related um, question. Well, John is kind of still, John Singer, who is in our audience, still is having some, I think he's having trouble conceptualizing what the differences are between um, what ARPA-H is and would do and what NIH would do or another or what industry would do. Um, John, does the internet um, analogy um, help at all with that, um, and we can certainly have you join us by phone or through the through audio if that would be useful. Um, let's see. Do you, can you all unmute John in case he wants to weigh in? Is that possible, Sam? Uh, hey guys, it's it's John Singer. I'm just listening. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you for joining oh. us, John. Hey, no worries, no worries at all. You know, listen, I think it's interesting, but, um, uh, you know, and I come from industry, um, pharma, healthcare provider, technology, and, and, and I guess I'm struggling to understand how the missions that were laid out as a, a, in the very beginning here are different um, or would lead to something different than what is currently being done sort of across the board already. I mean, I, I don't see the difference. Well, yes, inventing another big internet, but but you know, um, how how you know Google is doing that already, <laughs> right? So um, I, I don't see the difference. I think the idea is that we there the federal government's current research programs are somewhat 
limited in what they can do as as is industry. Um, although there are some innovators like Google who are willing to take some of those bigger risks, many in industry are not. And so this could help address the valley of death for one, where we have a great uh, foundation of basic research this, you know, focused at the cellular molecular level, but have yet to be able to get to the point where we can move that to into clinical research that industry might take on because it's too expensive, it's too time consuming, it's too difficult. Um, and ARPA-H would be able to uh, lend government funding to help get over some of those hurdles that exist in the current research eco ecosystem. Yeah, John, um, I, think, um, I think a good example actually comes from COVID, right? Um, we needed supplemental funding to do, and this would be private sector, would be public-private partnership, right? It's it's not gonna happen without the private sector, but you need that, you need the big picture funding to get at really faster vaccine development um, that can, can meet a large demand. And so, you know, it's examples like that. How do we come up with a universal diagnostic? Um, uh, some you know, of this, I think that, that the COVID vaccine example you just gave is interesting because I, you could argue Pfizer did it faster and without any government money. Pfizer did, and they invested far more money than anyone would have anticipated. They took a huge risk. And I don't know that we can rely on that same thing happening with the next pandemic um, or with, uh, again, a universal diagnostic. But I do think this is a really a good continued conversation to have just because I do think those in the ecosystem and patients particularly should be informing um, ARPA-H's mission and objectives going forward and making sure that money is being used widely, uh, wisely. So, but I don't know, I feel, I feel really hopeful um, uh, because for example, with rare diseases, the more we throw at that in terms of innovation, the faster we'll save lives and those lives are so precious. So, um, but um, let's move to other questions. I know we have a lot of them. Um, so, um, hey, and speaking of that, since I'm not able to see the whole chat, Sam, could you join us and start um, ticking through some of the questions here? Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much, Laura. This has been such a great conversation already. Um, so another question that we had is, is it possible that putting ARPA-H in one state could result in losing support among other members of Congress? Would it make more sense to keep it in the DC area and then maybe have some satellite campuses around the nation so that there's more investment across the, the country? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Uh, and I do think that the jockeying to have ARPA-H is less about where ARPA-H's contract or grant spending will go and more about job creation and just the prestige of having that located within a given state. DARPA does have satellite offices. So just because the headquarters of ARPA-H were in one place wouldn't preclude it from having offices elsewhere. Um, but the argument that I have heard for placing ARPA-H outside of the DC area and putting it in an area like Boston or Austin or in Silicon Valley is that it might give the agency a hiring edge just because it'd be in an area where you already have a lot of people working in biomedical research. Um, and it would also help imbue ARPA-H with this more innovative uh, culture that uh, not, not to knock on the DC area, I'm a, I'm a DC area person as well, uh, but I think the thought is that there is a distinct culture here and that's not necessarily the culture that you would seek for this really fast paced, high risk, high reward agency. And one thing uh, but ARPA-H could spend its money anywhere. Yeah. One thing Senator Burr said that I also think is cool is the idea of satellite offices all over the world. So what if you want, what if you could come up with an early detection system for pandemics, but you had to really house it all over the world and the idea for it in a really new technological form, what came from a uh, student at, in a college or university in a low and middle income country. And you were there, you caught that you were, there was a, there was an ARPA-H representative there who caught the idea, talked to industry, spread it globally, you know, so it's, um, it, there's a, there's a lot to be said for getting out of DC, always in my view, but <laughs> um, so other questions, Sam? Sure. Um, so are there any known or speculated front runners for the permanent director position? So it's interesting, Dr. Um, Prabhakar, whose name I'm probably mispronouncing, who was just nominated to direct OSTP, was actually considered one of the 
possible candidates to lead ARPA-H. Um, so I, I actually don't know if there's a front runner right now. And again, I think this some of this is going to shake out a little bit when we see who might be nominated to lead NIH. Great, great. So in your presentation, you spoke about other transactions being under one of the um, agreed upon things that ARPA-H can work through. Uh, could you give some clarity to what other transactions will need congressional approval? <laughs> They do not need congressional approval. So once an agency has the authority to make other transactions, they, they can use that authority. Um, and I don't want you all to think that another transaction is just an agency you know, throwing money at a, a private sector group or at an academic research institution and say, go do some work. We'll, we'll check on you in a little while. Um, they do typically still have an agreement. Um, again, our page is gonna be really milestone driven. Um, so, well, although it's not technically a contract or technically a grant, um, it's, it's still a formalized agreement between the two parties for how that project will be carried out. Um, let me just jump in to thank Amy Rick, Comstock Rick, for, um, as usual, catching things that Lauren, <laughs> Lauren and I miss and mentioning that another important role for ARPA-H is to take on projects where there really isn't an incentive in the private sector so that a new public partnership could be formed against whatever threat that is that, that you're working on. And I want to thank Ed Long for being Ed Long and helping us address some of the questions that are, are in the chat. You're so <laughs> wonderful, Ed, and we love you. So, um, okay, I'm sorry, Sam, go ahead. No worries at all. So as an, as an element of embracing risk, how will ARPA-H ensure that research failures are not detrimental to the careers of researchers? That is an interesting question. And I, I really think it comes down to the, the culture of this. Um, I think in an ARPA culture, failure is not thought to be a bad thing because it rules out one path that was not viable and leaves other remaining paths that may be viable. Um, and because ARPA-H is intended to be so milestone driven and because you have program managers working for a relatively short period of time, this is not going to be a situation where you ARPA-H is funding a project for a decade and then it ends up completely failing, or at least that's, that's not the intention. Rather, the intention is that you would learn with it pretty quickly within a few years if something's not a viable idea so you can move on to the next thing. And so I think that helps insulate people from those types of risks uh, if they were to be leading a project that ultimately wasn't successful. Definitely, definitely. So are, have any scientific goals and metrics for the first year of ARPA been outlined at this point? They have not been, although both the House and Senate bills would require ARPA-H to um, prepare a strategic plan and then update that plan every three or four years, depending on which piece of legislation you're looking at. Um, and so I think once we have a director in place, if authorizing language is enacted, we would start to see that strategic plan within either six months or a year, and then we'd get a bit more clarity on the way the agency is operating. Um, right now, with it just having been established in May and with, without a director at the helm and without much of a program management staff, um, I don't know that they are actually sending a lot of money out the door and really doing their work, but we'll see more of that in 23. And I think we have time for maybe one more question and kind of along those same lines. What do you think um, the next immediate needs are to move ARPA along in this process? Getting the director appointed I think is the biggest one. Um, whoever that is will really set the tone for the organization, um, not only in terms of setting research priorities, but in terms of building up that really innovative culture. And then once you have the director in place, you can start to hire the program managers and start to move the research forward. Um, with the authorities that were granted in the FY22 appropriations bill, um, ARPA-H does have what it needs to function. So while the authorizing language is not essential, at least for the short term, um, it would be, it would also be good if that could eventually be passed to give ARPA-H some of these authorities on a longer term basis for, versus the just a year over year for the appropriation cycle. Um, Sam, can I just jump in? I think there's a question I'd really love to see us. I know we don't have very much time, but um, I just want to answer the question about the role of state universities 
Um, you know, there is definitely a role in digit here for um, universities across the country and colleges across the country. So this would not be only private federal. It certainly is private academic technology, citizen scientists. It's where the good ideas are. And um, I think, again, that's a role for us as advocates is to make that case. We, we certainly don't want this agency, just like NIH, we really try to protect it from political influence. Same here with ARPA-H, but public will and great ideas are going to drive this agency. I'm so sorry that we've missed some questions um, when we have Lauren, our expert here. Uh, Mike Miller, for example, has great insights and questions in the chat. Thank you, Mike. Um, and you know, if we've missed any big ones, we'll try to get those to you, Lauren, so that we can spread the answers out to, to the community on this call. We've had such a great turnout. And that's because of you, Lauren. You've been wonderful as you always, always are. And um, thank you for joining us. Um, I am just sure I have housekeeping items here, Sam. I know um, we want to talk about our awards program. Um, and that is nominations are closing for our advocacy awards. There's information on our website. Could someone put that in the chat for us? A um, lot of great categories for, um, for folks to be nominated for awards. I bet awardees are on this call right now. <laughs> and so um, in, in um, research, in research advocacy, in public health, uh, nominate away, but do it quick. It's a really, it's a really easy nomination process. So check out our website or check out what we, the link that we have online. Join us for our next. Do we have our next alliance meeting set, Sam? Or are we going, you know, in the moment on it? In the moment. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're getting you an email. You'll receive an email in the next few days with our next alliance member meeting. I think we're taking July fourth week off because, listen, you guys don't want to be on a webinar. Let's face it. So um, thanks again. Um, email me, email Anne if you're interested in joining our alliance and see you next time. Thanks again, Lauren.